Um, look, I'm 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 first going to ask you uh, if you can introduce yourself for me because I'm, I'm sure you'll probably do a much better job uh, than I can do <laughs> if that's all right. <laughs> Way to put me on the spot. <laughs> like challenge accepted. <laughs> I'll mess this up. Yeah. So I'm Daryl Hayhurst. I'm a line developer at Pinnacle Entertainment. I've worked in a lot of different game companies in the last year and a lot of different non-gaming stuff before that. So you know, I got a. A vast shotgun blast of experiences that all led to this career. Um, and my big project right now is Legend of Ghost Mountain, which is on Kickstarter. I'm sure we'll have a link, you know, mm. that people can click and we can talk about that or we can talk about Savage Worlds in general. My game system of choice, even though I write game systems. <laughs> <laughs> Good to know. Yeah, well, hello, uh, Daryl, and welcome. Um, how are you doing? Doing great. That's good. Uh, yeah, so this is the RPG Quest podcast. My name is Chris, and yeah, if you haven't figured out already, we're going to be talking about Savage Worlds. And as I like to do with this podcast, before I jump in and start playing a new system, I like to find someone who hopefully, well, obviously you do, who knows what they're talking about, who can help you know guide me through the <laughs> system, you know, a bit of how it works, like what we need to, to get started. And of course, you know, Daryl, you're the, the expert in this case. I, I'm one of many, yeah. One of many. Uh, so yeah, you, you obviously, you looked at Savage Worlds and you thought, yes, this is the system that, that's going to provide the bones and structure for your setting, the legend of Ghost Mountain. Yeah, well, and, and well, so I didn't actually create the setting, right? The setting comes from the mind of Shane Hensley, the guy that wrote Savage Worlds in the first place. Right. And I've worked with Shane on many projects. Um, and it's a genre that I deeply love and am very familiar with, and he's listened to me blab about for years. So when it came time for to move Legend of Ghost Mountain from an idea on paper with a few pieces of control art to a more developed book is, you know, he's got to reach out and find someone that can tackle that process, which is tr like, it's trickier than even just writing a base game, right? Because you're, you're bringing someone else's vision to life and adding elements to it and mm. creating a base setting to make sure that it's covering these bases. Uh, so, you know, he was like, you know, I think you're my guy for this. And I'm like, I get to play in that sandbox. Yes, please. <laughs> <laughs> uh, okay. So Ghost Mountain came from the mind of, as you were saying, Shane Hensley, who created Savage Worlds. Yeah. Um, so tell me a bit more about like, yeah, Savage Worlds, where it came from, uh, how you got involved. Yeah. Uh, yeah, so, yeah. The evolution in the game. Yeah. I mean, I'm a pulp fan. Shane's a pulp fan in Savage Worlds when it first came out like 20 years ago. In fact, I think exactly 20 years ago, like its cover was pulp guys, you know, like a, a, a space person, you know, Flash Gordon style, you know, a, a 1930s style adventurer and like, mm. like a cowboy. Right. And that speaks to me. Right. Like, that's what I want to play. And then their first setting that they did for it was called 50 Fathoms. And it's pirates in a magical realm. Actually, I'm sorry. That's the second setting. First one was Evernight, which was fantasy. I missed that one. Oh, when it came yeah. Out. I've heard of that yeah. one. Yeah. Yeah. That's a tricky setting, right? Like, it's, it's, I can't even talk about it without spoiling the whole gag behind Evernight. <laughs> yes. <right>? Yeah. 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 <laughs> it's one of those ones I've looked at and I'd be like, damn, I really want to to give this a run sometime. I know. Well, hopefully we'll do more with Evernight, you know, in the future. Knock on wood, right? Cool. But 50 Fathoms was the one where I started and it had this new, like, on the downside, oh, I'm having, having to learn new mechanics, right? Yeah. On the upside, the adventure part of it, regardless of any mechanical side of it, blew my mind when I got into it. And it was the their first real plot point. Like Evernight isn't quite a plot point, you know, in the same way that 50 Fathoms was, where it's got these major story beat chapters and there are multiple paths to get between those chapters. Um, and they're kind of fast and loose, right? Like, look, mm. you go into this island, here's what's going on there. By the time you leave there, a bunch of people are going to be dead and the plot gets to move on, right? Oh, God. <laughs> and then behind the plot points are Savage Tales, and they are triggered by different events. So it's like, oh, you go to this island, here are three different Savage Tales 
that could all trigger here. And a lot of them have these like clues that lead to other islands where other savage tales kick in. And some of them get like super epic and can run parallel to the plot points or, you know, it, and it was the first time I had played in a kind of sandbox environment with a big map and the different islands. And we could go from place to place. And that journey wasn't hard to do. Right. It's like, oh, this feels right. Like we're in control here. I get to choose what island I'm going to. I don't want to go to that one that's 20 days away. We're going to run out of food and there's pirates over there. Let's go to this one over here. It's only 10 days away and it's in safer waters. Here's what happens when you do. And so there's all this control that you feel like you've got as a player. And as a GM, the preparation was very low because we like to joke. We all got old and like in college, you could afford to you know, spend 12 hours prepping, and you know, creating all these notes and all these characters. Mm. But in a, the nice thing about a plot point is you can just pick it up and kind of go. And I only need a few things for tonight's session. And I might get three times more happening than I expected. That's OK. Turn to page 33 and just move on to the next Savage Taylor plot point and keep going. Yeah. And. Man, it was great. Like that changed the way I ran games. Uh, and, and over time, as I became more familiar with Savage Worlds as a system, it was more like, dang, it's pretty smooth. I really like it. And then the new edition, way we call it, Savage Worlds Adventure Edition, mm -hmm. smoothed out any rough edges that were left. And now it's like, it's my go to. And like I say, I write systems like I do this for a living. It's cool and I love them all. But if I'm just like thrown into a gap where it's like, by the way, I want to run you know, something that caught my fancy based on a television show or a movie or whatever, it is easiest for me to put it together in Savage Worlds and just run with it. Yeah, yeah. And like you said, it sort of it, it seems very geared towards heroic pulp oh, yeah. style it, adventures. Yeah, it, it is right. It's a mistake to call it a generic system because it's not quite generic and that it's got that pulpy adventure thing. There are setting rules that you can tag in and out to that adjust that, like the turn the dials up and down on things. But overall it's like, Oh man, you're going to do big things. You're going to have this action. And it's also just going to be dripping in horror. Like you just can't get away with it. <laughs> you, can't, you can't get nice. away from it. <laughs> Um, I, I want to I want to talk a little bit about just a little bit about the system in in more details yeah. in a bit. But I guess like that's just a, a, a glowing review for Fifty Fathoms of the Savage Worlds. But I guess I just want to ask like yeah. for a complete noob and someone like myself, or you know maybe someone who's who's just played like D and D or Five E or something like that. Like, yeah, yeah. what would be your pitch to try and get them to come over and and check out Savage Worlds? Right. So at its heart, it's a you know very simple, elegant dice system a very adventurous system, you know, like the, you're going to say what you want to do. There's going to be one die roll. You're going to, you've got these things called bennies. And if you don't like how the roll goes, you're going to spend bennies and that's going to give you some control over the narrative, right? There are going to be times where you fail. And here's the thing about savage worlds. It's a dangerous system. Like in a dungeons and dragons situation, once you've got a certain number of hit points, you're not that afraid of one stroke of a sword, right? In Savage Worlds, we joke our dice explode, right? It's called acing. Whenever the die hits the top number, you will roll another die and add to it. And that means ridiculous things can happen where it's like, okay, <laughs> it takes a lot of luck, but you can be lucky enough to one punch a dragon or a monster or something. And it's a huge <laughs> moment at the table when it happens, right? I was like, all right, I roll my D six of damage. What did you do? 58. <laughs> like, well, okay, <laughs> that's a dead dragon. <laughs> We're moving on. Right. <laughs> and, yeah. and like those huge moments make stories and that's what we like, you know? Yeah. No, I mean, yeah, that sounds, I mean, I'm sold. I, I was already sold, but I'm even more <laughs> sold now. Um, yeah, well, let, before we get into the system a bit more, um, tell me, tell yeah, me yeah. a little bit more about the legend of Ghost Mountain. Yes. So it's kind of our, we were saying it's our, our uh, mystical martial arts mayhem setting, right? And so it's got 
the, you know, the flavor of a wuxia setting. It's not specifically set in like a mystical China or anything like that. However, you know, it's its own world. But, you know, if, if you know the genre, the tropes are there. And the the story of the game is your characters are called ghost wardens. And there is a, a gate to the underworld, you know, a gate to hell. And the rulers of hell, the, the underworld kings, have emissaries on Earth that have special powers. They can see ghosts. They can see, you know, fight the undead. And when you die, your soul is supposed to go through the gate for judgment and eventually get reborn. Not everyone does what they're supposed to do. You know, <laughs> ghosts go through by the same rules as humans, right? Mm-hmm. Like some people just don't follow instructions. And that's where the ghost wardens come in. They've got to deal with this. Sometimes it's monsters. Sometimes it's just someone in a bad situation. So it's violence isn't always the answer here. Right. Um, and, but one way or another, you've got to resolve these issues between the living and the dead. And in the game itself, the plot point is a massive event has happened. And now a, entire army of the dead is rising and souls are, you know, not going where they're supposed to, like the gate's been choked off and there's demons starting to pop up all around the realm. And it's up to our plucky adventurers to go figure out what is happening and try and reopen the gate and get things going again and possibly save the empire while they're at it. Wow. (laughs) So it's sort of like Wusha meets uh i don't know ghost hunters and these supernatural elements and yeah yes exactly right like i mean if you've if you've seen movies like um uh mr vampire or chinese ghost story like any of those series like that is very strongly you know connective tissue like basis for this kind of thing these are these are stories that exist in the source material and we're, we're just taking our own spin on them. Yeah. And part of our spin is like the, what empowers the dead are their strong emotions. And that's the same energy that empowers the heroes. So the martial arts styles that they use are going to be based on emotions rather than kind of like animal configuration Kung Fu. So it's like, I don't, I don't know like monkey fist or anything like that or, or tiger claws, what I know is the sorrowful palms or, you know, the like joyful step, you know, things like that, you know, and cool. that helps you role play as well. Yeah. You know? Yeah. No, that's awesome. Um, yeah. And you've, you've, it's, so it's, it's, it's been on Kickstarter. Um, the Kickstarter is about to wrap yeah. up. How, how's the Kickstarter been going? It's been fantastic. Oh, but like we were, you're always wondering when you put out a new setting, right? Because like, Savage Worlds has fans and we've got people that buy our settings, but every setting is different. Right. And it's going to attract different people. Yeah. And you're never positive whether that new thing is going to take off or no one's going to care. But this one took off like everyone likes it. So, oh, thank goodness. And I can't wait till the files get in people's hands so they can start playing. Like We've got review copies out and. I've run it at conventions and everybody's enjoyed it. So very soon, a lot more people will will get their try. Awesome. Oh, good to hear. So not in too much detail, but I'm hoping you can help me get stuck into a little bit of just the rules and the mechanics and the basics of, yeah. of Savage Worlds. Um, first things first, just, yeah, the, a clarification. You were saying there's been a few different editions, but... The most recent edition, and I think the one that we're just going to be talking about, is Savage Worlds Adventure Edition. Yep, Savage Worlds Adventure Edition. It's got a nice pulp cover. It's got, like, kind of our iconic characters, Red. And if the, the more books you read, especially if you read behind the lines, like, Red's got... Red has a specific player, and the character that she plays always has red hair. So you will see Red's character, like, all over the art in different settings and stuff. And, you know, like, <laughs> ah, that's that's Red playing Red's character. Got it, right? Yeah, so you got Red on the cover, kind of in a pulp, you know, pulp setting. And, you know, there's wintry snow and Yetis in the background. If you see Yetis on it, that's Swain, right? Got it. <laughs> and one thing about it is... Not everything's been converted to suede yet, and there's older material, and the previous one was called Deluxe. 
there were, you know, there was Savage Worlds Deluxe, there were Savage Worlds Explorers. The nice thing is the differences between the editions are actually pretty minor. Right. Like you like there's a one sheet piece of paper that we give that will let you convert a previous an older setting to suede. Like here's what you need to change to be able to run this. And it all fits on basically one page. Oh nice. But the but the interesting thing about it is the differences are subtle. So yeah, like Overall, I mean, the stats are all named the same. The the edges, the benefits that you've got are all named the same. And their effects are very similar. But there's just little things that have been smoothed out and enhanced and easier. So Suede's definitely the way to go, everyone. <laughs> um, but if you do have older stuff, you're still going to be able to use it with very little work. Yeah, great. That's good to know. Um so when when I'm when I'm looking at a system, I always find the the easiest thing to do for me to start figuring out how a system works is to look at a character sheet and start making up a character, which I had a little go yeah. at doing the other day. So I guess we'll start there. And one thing I noticed, uh, Savage Worlds works a little different from most other RPGs. I think there are some that do this, but this seems to be the main one. And that's in, instead of with your stats or with your traits. Instead of numbers, right, you, you're assigned different dice. Dice, yeah. So, and what I tell people when they're first starting to play is four is the magic number, right? You're going to roll a die. You're trying to get a four or better on that die. If you can hit a four, that's success, right? There are exceptions to that, but there are going to be exceptions. So four is the magic number. Your, your worst skill die is a D4. So, hey, on a four, you made it. On a one, two, three, you failed. D6 is kind of average, and hey, what do you know? 50% of the time, you're making it. D8's good. D10's fantastic. D12 is like legendary, right? Right. So on all of your attributes and skills, which collectively we just call traits, all your traits are going to have a number between D4 and D12, and as you level up, you can increase them. Like, I'm going to go from a D4 to a D6, a D6 to a D8. Yeah. And... In a nutshell, like that's the system, right? And then the one, two tricky things we add to that. Tricky thing number one, the wild die. Yeah. Heroes are better than scrubs, right? And as a hero, not only do you roll your trait die, you also roll what's called a wild die. It's just a D6. But hey, a D6 is always going to, you know, 50% for or better, right? So even if you suck as something as a hero, you're D4, the fact that you're a hero means you're also rolling a D6 and you're taking the better die yeah. between the two. So you're, you're good at things, you know? Yeah. So really and you have a D6. Trick, yeah. 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 Well, right. Yeah. But the nice thing is like, oh yeah, here's the, the, the second part of that is acing. Whereas if you get the, the, the maximum number on a die, you, it it blows up and you get to add another die of that type to the total, right? So, oh, my my D4 did roll a four. Awesome. I get to roll another D4, and that one's a three. So I've got a total of seven there. My D6 rolled a two. Hmm. All right, man, my D4 is the better value here by far. You know, I've just got an extra chance with the wild die to do something. And that means even if you're bad, you might win a contested roll or do something with a really big penalty. Like penalties like, oh, this is hard to do. You're minus four to this. Essentially, now I've got to roll an eight or better. Right. Yeah. And then and doing things well, like there's a level of success. Like if you beat your target by four, that's called getting a raise and you you get benefits, right? Like, oh, you did it really well. You did it stylishly, right? You know, here's what happens. Ah, uh, yeah, nice. And that's why even if it's just four, getting those big numbers can matter. You're like, oh, I don't know. I got it with a raise. So even if, yeah, I've got a D10 skill, four, I've got a better chance to get a raise than someone with just a D4 does. Nice. So. And yeah, and if you get a raise, that might be like, uh, I don't know, saying you're, you're making like an academics check or something like that. You might get yes. a little bit More, of extra extra information or something like that. Exactly. You can get extra information, you know, and 
in, in combat, you will do additional damage, you know, things like that. Nice. Yeah. I think the skills and stats I've had a look, they're pretty straightforward. Like all oh, the, the, the main, the, the attributes. Idea, yeah. You're yeah. supposed to be able to read them and kind of get what this is like strength. I wonder what that does. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Piloting. What would I use this for? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> it says agility, smarts, strength, spirit, and vigor. So that right. all makes like pretty good sense. They're your main, uh, yeah. Attributes. Those are your five attributes. And then you've got skills, which is the more specialized sort of stuff, which like you were saying, might be piloting, it might be academics. Yeah. And you kind of choose what dice you put into those. And then if you're unskilled, it's a it's a D4 minus two. Yeah, you roll a D4 like everything else, but there's that extra minus two penalty because you have no idea what you're doing. But you get your wild dime, maybe you can make it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Or or it may it may explode. Yeah, or may ace. Sorry. Yeah. yeah exactly. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I mean, almost everyone says explode, but ace is the term. Like you know, a Savage Worlds player will say ace. Everyone else will be like, oh, it exploded. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm used to things like World of Darkness. I think they 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 do that in the rules as well. Sometimes yeah. they yep. call it exploding. Dice, yeah. But yeah. Acing yeah. sounds acing sounds cooler. Well, there's a lot of poker terms in Savage Worlds because mm. cards are part of the thing, and it also grew out of, you know, it, it's a very distinct iteration, but you can trace its ancestry back to Deadlands, which Shane wrote, and Deadlands was also heavily based on poker and cards, so yeah. a lot of these terms have those that these kind of references to Hoyle's games and, and things that you might do in a poker game. Yeah, we'll get we'll get into some of that hopefully. But oh, um, yeah. there was one final final thing about uh, yeah. skill checks I want to ask is like, what if you roll two ones like Snake Eyes? Is that a crit? I should that's a crit fail. Yeah, yeah. If if yeah, if you get two ones, that's a crit fail, right? And like, there was a lot of previous to Swade. We, you know, in, in, you, every player's got what's called bennies. You can just get a three three poker chips, right? And if you don't like your roll, you spend one of your bennies and you re-roll it. And you take the better one, whichever one's better. Nice. The exception is if you get a crit fail, you can't bend anymore and you get the worst possible <laughs> result. And that's your like, even though you've got a wild die and you're a badass, that D4 is more likely to get a one. And if your wild die is also a one, that's two ones. Now you're in trouble mm. and something terrible happened. Honestly, like, all my best gaming stories are from crit fails. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's, so people are like, yeah, people are terrified of them. Like, oh, I don't like that. I can't reroll a crit fail. It's like, just lean into it, man. Savage worlds. You're going to get hurt. It'll be okay. Yeah, I mean, oh. it's it's like a movie. It's always the most thrilling, exciting part is when the hero fails. You know, those moments of tension. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, and some settings do fun things with that. So one of our, our partners, Carl Kiesler, has got a, 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 a standalone setting called Trailer Park Shark Attack. Oh, my God. And you play the denizens. Yeah, oh, I know, right? <laughs> you play the denizens of this trailer park, and, of course, it floods, and there's sharks. And their setting rule is that anytime you roll a critical fail for any reason, that character is immediately eaten by a shark and dies. <laughs> <laughs> And he's just got a stack of these trailer park denizens. You're like, all right, next denizen, you know, and you just go forward. With Amazing. It. Oh, it's hilarious. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, um, yeah. Well, let's 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 move on to 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 combat then. Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, let's. I guess we'll start with square one in a combat scenario. Like, what's the first thing that happens? That usually, you roll initiative, right? Yeah, right. And while in other games you roll initiative, in Savage Worlds you deal action cards, right? You use a standard poker deck, and everyone gets a card, and the higher your card is, the faster you go. Hmm. And there's a, that's actually a barrier to some people, because A, they're, they're used to rolling dice, and they don't like the cards are involved here. But I keep after them, like, oh no, my God, you've got to try it, right? Once you try it, like, even if I'm playing D&D, &D, uh, I'm like, hey, let's just use cards instead, because all of these cool things come out of it, where you would never, in, in a game where you roll for initiative, you wouldn't want to re-roll initiative every round, because it's time-consuming, and the order can be cluttered, and it, it's difficult to know who's gone and who hasn't, and all that. With cards, we do deal a new initiative order every round, and it's instant and seamless. 
right? You just get a card and you can see everyone's yeah. got a card face up in front of them. All right, Ace, you're up. Yeah, of course. Yeah. And then once they go, you collect their card. There's no card there. You know, their action's done. They've finished. Right. And so it's like super fast, super smooth. And you get these extra moments, right? Like instead of rolling low, you'll just get a low card and you'll be like, oh, man, you can pay a Benny and get a new card. Maybe it'll be better. <laughs> <laughs> but also, if you get Delta Joker, that's like your moment, right? Like you get the spotlight. Any role that you do is going to get a plus two bonus and you can go whenever you want. And you're like, yep, whatever. I'm going to wait until that guy's about to go and he declares his action. I'm like, I'm using my Joker. Bam. I'm going to mess his day up. Nice. And I've got all these benefits of doing it. And also when you get a Joker, everyone on your team gets a Benny, including you. Oh, wow. Which is Oh, which is tragic when the GM gets it, because all the bad guys now have bennies, and you're like, oh, my God, we're going to die. <laughs> and then you guys get a Benny, you know, get get a Joker, and you're like, oh, and then the momentum shifts to your side of the table, because Benny's let you do these big things, right? And so it's like, you just get this excitement that it generates. It's great, right? And it also, GMs have a tendency, especially new ones, they don't remember to give out bennies when people do awesome things. Like they're a great tool for training your players to do awesome things or role play or, you know, like do the things that you want to see. Like, oh, man, that's an awesome idea. Have a Benny. Like, oh, you found the clue here. Have a Benny. Now people are looking for clues. Right. Yeah. Like you can kind of guide the behaviors around the table, the things that you like. And but early on, you're not used to that because not a lot of games do that. Some do, but not a lot. So you don't remember, and the game works better when you've got more bennies. So there's this rule, Jokers. Joker's wild. Nice. You got a Joker, everybody gets a Benny. Bam! So it keeps the keeps the bennies flowing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, cool. So bennies are kind of, you're also meant to be a reward for like cool role-playing, cool ideas, that kind of thing that you're meant to hand out to the players yeah. as well. Yeah. Nice. Yeah, and then for like initiative control, where you'd be like, well, in another game, I could have like a very high dex. And I would have this bonus, so that would affect my role. Mm. How do I be faster? In Savage Worlds, we've got edges that affect it, which is like, oh, if you get a card that's five or lower, throw it away and get a new one. Nice. And I've seen people get like seven cards in a row until they finally get like a king or something good, right? And then the other one, that's that's if you're fast, quick, it's called. And then the other one is level-headed, where you get dealt two cards and you get to pick which one. Nice. It makes you a much more like kind of tactical fighter. It's yeah. super. It's it, it adds a lot, right? So it's like, oh my god, people don't don't poo poo the cards. Like use them, just use them. It's great. <laughs> You'll never go back. Yeah, yeah. Well, my my least favorite thing about like running D and D games is counting down all the initiative and then arranging everything in yeah. order, like based on numbers. Like, oh god, and it always t just takes so long. So yeah, um, it definitely sounds easier. It, it is, and it's gone. Like. Yeah, exactly. When you get the cards, it's gone. That's why I'm like, oh, my God, can we just use cards everywhere? <laughs> yeah. Some people are like crying like, no, cards are the worst. <laughs> but no, I mean, it's completely it's really random anyway. With a, D, with a D20, <laughs> you've still got 20 different options you could get. So, yeah. yeah. In older editions, there, were a side, there was a sidebar on how to use dice rolls instead of cards. And in Suede, we're just like, you know what? This is just too integral to the game. You miss too much if you don't use the cards. Just just use them, everyone. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, that sounds, I mean, yeah, that sounds easy enough. So let's say my turn comes around. Yeah. Um, then what? I assume, you know, like other games, you get your movement, you get your action, that kind of thing. Yeah. So essentially, the everyone gets an action. You can take up to three actions if you want. You're just going to be penalized if you do more than one. So... Most, especially low level, like lower rank characters, you're going to want to take one action and just do that. But if it's a critical situation, or if you've got a Joker because you've got these bonuses, you can afford to take two of them and take the minus two penalty on both, or three at minus four at all of them. Ah. Um, you get to move, which is independent of actions. Like it's not an action to move; it's just something that happens on your turns. It's my turn; I can move my six. My six squares, you know, almost exactly the same as Dungeons and Dragons. Like, bam, just do it. Um, one thing that's a little different in Savage Worlds is if you run, 
you don't double your movement. You roll a die. Oh, okay. And add that much. And that's just to simulate, like, we're not going to put rocks on the map or rough ground or, or, you know, things like that. When you run, you roll. And if you roll high, great. You found a good path or, you know, you were fast. If you roll low, it's like oh, you hit rough ground. You know, you're moving around, like you're moving around it or you just were kind of slow this round. And it it, adds, it makes it tricky <laughs> when, you, when you're charging and things like that. It adds an element to it. Yeah, nice. Um, and then um, you got your your options when you go, and your general one is, hey, you can attack, sure. And when I say four is the magic number, one of the exceptions is if you're in melee, your target is rather than four, it's the your foe's parry. They've just got a number usually between two and six. And that's the number that you have to hit instead of four. Right. And if it's a ranged attack, like a gun or a bow or whatever, it's back to just four. So, like, you can be really tough in hand to hand and great at blocking and whatever. But that ain't gonna help you if you're getting shot. The only thing that's gonna help you is cover there. Like, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and cover would be a penalty on the roll. And that adds a bunch of like tactical stuff where you're like, oh man. Like, I need to get out of the way. I need to drop down. I need to find cover. Or I need to get up in his face where my parry is going to make a big difference, right? Yeah, yeah, totally. That's good. I think that, that kind of simulates the deadliness, the lethality of, of guns and ranged weapons. Kind of like Call of Cthulhu and stuff like it that. Rather than he, trying to hit an AC, does. Yeah, you're just rolling to shoot. And if you shoot, you hit. It yeah. does. Yeah, exactly. I got them. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> now, like range makes it harder and cover makes it harder. And those are the elements that you play with there. Right, right. right. And there is even an edge called dodge that actually makes you harder to hit. But it's still just that flat number and usually much easier to hit than someone's berry. Cool. Cool. Okay. Well, let's say let's say an attack hits, and then then what? Like, how do, how yeah. damage? How does damage and, and hit points work in Savage Worlds? Right. Yeah. So we don't do hit points. Right. What we do and. There's two levels here, right? There's heroes and then there's everyone else. <laughs> right. And the, yeah. And you've got a number called your toughness and you're going to roll damage dice. Like, like a lot of stuff's going to do 2d, like a gun is going to do 2d6 damage. You're rolling them both and you're adding them together. And that's how much damage you do. And these die rolls can ace as well. So you can get ridiculously high damage numbers or you can punk out. Right. And Characters are going to have a toughness usually around five or six, you know, sometimes more if you've got armor and like that adds to it. Yeah. And you just compare the rolled damage to your toughness. And if it's less than you bounced it, you're like, whatever, bring it. I take it on the chin. Give me more. (laughs) If it's more than your toughness, then you're called shaken. And we like to say up, down or off the table. Up is your fine. Down is your shaken. Off the table is you're out of here. You're done. And shaken on your next turn, you're going to need to roll spirit to get back up again and act. If you fail, you can still move because movement is not an action. Right, So you can get out of the way. You can find somewhere and people can help you with your roll or you can just spend a Benny and say, I make it. Bam. Like I'm up. Ah, Yeah, right. Um, But if you're attacked in the meantime and get shaken again, that's going to cause wounds. Right. And also, four is the magic number. If it beats your toughness by four, that does a wound. If it beats it by another four, that's another wound. Another four, another wound. So scrubs have zero wounds. If you do a wound to them, they're off the table. They're done. Heroes have three wounds, so they can take some punishment there. Right. But that one huge roll can do like four wounds, five wounds or whatever. And you're like, oh, I'm in trouble, right? Right, yeah. So if you get like more than 12 or would it be more than 16 above their their toughness, they would just out. Yeah, they're just done, right? And then the the extra element that heroes and villains have is they can soak. You can spend a Benny, you can roll Vigor, and if, again, four is the magic number, if you make four, that takes away one of those wounds. Nice. You just like, I take it or I dodge it or whatever the trapping of that is. I avoid that damage in some way. And that roll can go as high as you want. So it's like, oh my God, he did 50 damage. Like, I'm going to take, you know, 10 wounds. Well, I just happened to roll, you know, 40 on my soak. <laughs> I avoid it all. Huge moments, you know, when those things happen. It's very, like, it can be swingy. 
more than likely you're like, oh man, instead I just crit fail. So I'm taking that yeah. damage. Like I'm dead. <laughs> Uh, I really like the idea of um, like being stunned as well. I'm I'm like just in my mind imagining it like copping a punch to the face and like having like, you know, cartoon birds around the head or whatever, like you're just out for that yeah. round kind of thing. It, it is, but it also brings in that tactical element of like, oh man, I just shook this guy. Someone else get on him before he recovers because we're more likely to take him down mm. while he's vulnerable like this. Or while he's shaken, I can move away. Like normally if you move away from someone, they get a free swing at you. If they're shaken, they don't. So it's like, oh, I popped him. I shook him. Now's my chance to go break away and go get cover safely. Yeah. Like, but that's just attacks. And one of the, I think the thrilling things about Savage Worlds is there's this whole other layer called tests. And an attack that works that way where it's like, I roll my attack. If I hit, I roll damage. Bam, 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 bam. I'm doing that. Tests, on the other hand, you've got other traits or if you can make the case for it narratively, any of the traits could work, right? It's like, I'm going to use athletics. I'm swinging off a chandelier, you know, all, <laughs> all swashbuckler style, and, and I'm distracting him, right? You roll your athletics, and the, it's called an opposed roll. They roll essentially the trait that's associated with that. So that would be agility is what they roll. If you beat them... You get to choose. Are they distracted? Minus two to everything they do until the end of their turn. Or are they vulnerable? Plus two when other people go to attack them. Ah. And if you get it, if you beat them with a raise, they can be shaken. Oh, nice. <laughs> right. So, yeah. And, and it's great because like, so even if you're not a fighter, you can be like, well, I've got persuasion or taunt. I'm going to taunt this guy and I'm going to set him up for my teammates to attack. Or I'm going to, yeah, I'm going to trash talk him so hard that he becomes shaken <laughs> and now I can move away yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> while he's like scratching his head going, what did you just say? And all oh, the opportunities that opens up, you know, and especially for a new player where they're like, well, how do I do this? It's like, well, just describe what you want to do. I want to swing on the chandelier and mess him up. Awesome. Roll athletics. Bam. You beat him. You want him to be vulnerable or distracted. Sounds like distracted. Done move on very smooth and very cinematic the way yeah it can work out. yeah cinematic is definitely the word um and one thing i noticed i like that you don't necessarily i i think when you when you take three wounds you're not necessarily killed outright right you become incapacitated Correct. which i think is very sort of like tv pulp style you know adventure it, as well it but, is yeah like usually with that point you're down and you're bleeding and your teammates have got like a limited amount of time to come do first aid before you bleed out and die or if you've got a great vigor you can roll really well and just stabilize on your own mm. but like you say it does give you those cinematic moments like you know aragorn getting wiped out in the battle and falling in the river he's incapacitated but he rolls great on his vigor he shakes it off an hour later, wakes up like, ugh, he's still wounded, needs to come back, you know, and get healed, but he's alive. Yeah. You know? Yeah. So <laughs> even if you get one punch, you might not be dead. Yeah. I also like it kind of um reminds me of sort of like, you know, the Indiana Jones scenes or whatever. It's like you you, you get in the yes. fist fight and you beat all the guys. And rather than it being, a, you know, a, a fantasy thing where it's a gory fight to the death, it's just like all the enemies just scramble and run away at the end of the fight. Like yeah. that kind of thing. Oh, yeah. and, most, and most attacks you can even designate as non-lethal. And if you designate an attack as non-lethal, they don't have to roll to bleed out. They're right. just incapacitated and they're fine. Yeah. Cool. Yeah, obviously there are other rules for things like chases and vehicles and mass battles and all that kind of stuff we won't go into that but but i like that they're there in the book yeah and that's the thing like people can look at all of that and be a little bit overwhelmed and it's like okay the, the suede book's broken up and like here are the basic rules which are basically what we just talked about and then here's an extra layer of options you know for for sort of more general combat situations you can ignore those and the game still works just fine and then beyond that there's the toolkit which has got all of these even deeper things that really make the game explode, right? You know, dramatic tasks. I need to disarm a bomb. Feels like more than just a skill roll, but, you know, what do I do? How do I handle that? Super fun. A chase. How do I handle hmm. it? A mass battle. How do I handle it? You, you can just roll dice and move on. That's absolutely an option. And when you're new, the recommended option, right? Keep it simple. 
But when you're ready for that extra stuff and you start digging into it, oh my God, like, and it changes the way we write adventures, the way I write them, right? Because in other games where it's like, all right, well, I know how combat works. I can set up a combat encounter. I want them to have a argument. You know, the, the, there's, there's a mob that's trying to get ready to do a thing. And I want to build a scene around them talking down this mob. Is that just a skill role? Is it a skill challenge? Like, how do how do I do that in a way that is going to be a satisfying scene? And it's average worlds. You just go, ah, social conflict. This is how I'm going to use it. This is the framework. Bam. And I know it's going to work out fine. But also, don't mess with that till you're ready. Yeah, right? yeah, yeah, of course. But it's good that the options are there. Because we yeah, have one thing that in yeah. other systems, I've always, it's always, I find chases are always the hardest to try and figure out how to make it cinematic and exciting and not yeah. just not just a few right. roles. Well, and and this is something that we're, like, our challenge, right, is that the Suede core book has to cover a lot of ground. So there's all these rules for the chase and like, here's how it works and da, 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 da. And you read them and like, even someone like me, the first time you read through it, like you bounce off it. Like, oh my God, there's so much going on here. Like, I don't even know. And one of the things we're trying to get better about is like, okay, here's the situation, like in this module, you know, in this adventure, right? Here's a chase. Here's the stuff that's relevant, right? Like, you know, you can ignore most of these rules. All you need to know is, Here's, you know, here's how the cards work during it. You're rolling athletics. You're trying to get your distance this way. Once you get this much distance, you escape or you catch mm, the guy. Mm. The end, right? There's a lot of other options because the same rule set will work for, you know, a sailing ship chasing down another sailing ship to board it or to space fighters, like dog fighting, yeah. <laughs> like, or cars. It was so like, there's a lot of variations in there to keep track of and that can be overwhelming. So it's like, okay, take a step back, keep it simple. You know? Yeah, for sure. So look, we, we've, uh, we've, we've talked about traits, uh, your attributes and skills. Something else I've noticed on the, the character sheet, and you mentioned this a few times, so there's there's edges and hindrances. Yeah. So they, these sort of come out in character creation, right? So can you, can you help me uh, understand sort of what they are and how they work? Yeah, so like hindrances are actually what we recommend people do first. <laughs> because, I mean, they are your, 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 your disadvantages, your, your personality quirks, right? Like, oh, this character is curious or bloodthirsty or ugly or, you know, whatever <laughs> it may be, but it gives you something to hang on to when you're role playing. Right. Like, mm. and once you pick your hindrances, you've got a pretty good idea of who this character is and everything else comes from that in a lot of ways. And pro tip hindrances are also a very nice way to generate bennies during play, right? Where you're like, aha, like, I am a curious guy. What do you do? I'm going to go off on, let's split the party, and I'm going to go looking for clues alone in the dark attic. And, you know, you're kind of looking at the GM yeah, like, well, that's yeah. probably worth a Benny, right? <laughs> you know? <laughs> and it's like, yes, it probably is. Totally. Um, and, and they also give you extra points to buy up your traits or edges. And edges are what make your character distinctive. They let you break the rules in different ways, right? So it's like, I want to be a really good melee fighter. I'm going to take something like Frenzy, which means when I roll to attack someone in hand-to-hand -hand combat, I'm rolling two trade dice in a wild die. And I'm taking the best two of that group. So it's essentially two attacks right? Um, every round. Or I can dodge pretty well. I've got dodge. Ranged attacks like guns and bows are minus one to hit me. Level-headed, I get two cards from being dealt initiative. Quick, if it's a five or lower card, I'm throwing it away. Deadshot, if I get a joker, I do double damage with ranged oh, attacks. Wow. <laughs> oh, I know, you talk about a big moment, like there it is, right? Like, yeah. oh, yeah, like you think they're done for when that happens. So they're they're... 
they're all these things and they, they come in different categories and all of the settings have a few extra edges that help flesh out those areas of the setting. Right. Like in Legend of Ghost Mountain, we'll have additional martial arts ones. Like, all right, here's how you're different from other martial artists. You've got this kind of weapon training or, you know, light step. So you can run across, you know, blades of grass and are very quick and can leap or, you know, you've got unyielding skin and can soak damage really well. <laughs> like those are the, the kinds of things that bring out like, here's my niche. Here's what I'm awesome at, you know, and some are combat related, some are social related, some are background related. Like you can be famous in the setting. Yeah. People will recognize you and you get benefits for that. Be charismatic, which lets you reroll persuasion and performance. So yeah, there's a lot of fun stuff. Yeah, that's awesome. And then there's some of the other ones that are um some of the other edges are, are powers, like power related. So like magic and weird science and that kind of thing. Yes. So, so that kind of opens up a whole whole another angle of play, right? Yeah, it does. There's this whole other level. Like not every setting is going to have powers, right? Like if it's a more modern day realistic setting, you might not have powers. But in something with magic or with weird stuff like Deadlands, which is kind of like the premier setting for Savage Worlds. There's a lot of magic being thrown around by you know, hucksters, they're called, which have learned magic from Hoyle's games, or priests who can call down the fury of God, you know, or shamans, like who can mm. you know, bring that spirit magic into play, or mad scientists who built kind of almost demonic devices, essentially, that are projecting <laughs> energy and using this stuff called ghost rock to do it. And what's interesting about Savage Worlds is they all use the same framework, right? They're just powers. And we have a list of powers, like Bolt just does damage at range. Flight just lets you fly. Growth makes you bigger. You know, like right. there are these big categories, right? Boost trait. And that, like it's very open, right? Like, oh, I'm, I could boost this person's fighting. What am I doing? Um, I'm, that's probably an adrenaline shot or something that makes them faster, you know, like some, something like that. Yeah, 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 right. So the rest is just kind of flavor. So a bolt might be it, firing magic out of your hands or it might be your like weird electricity gun or something that exactly. you Exactly. And yeah. we call those trappings and the trappings can have an effect on things, but at heart, they're all the same powers with different trappings. So what, and once you learn those and the, the different modifiers that you can stack on them, you can do so much with so little. Like we don't need entire books of spells because we kind of got it covered. That's, a, that's actually a challenge at some points where we're like, oh, like we would like to add some additional magical options for a fantasy setting. And we're kind of like, nope, that's just this power with an extra modifier. Nope, we've already got that. We've already got that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> like, like finding those new niches can be tough. But that's also, that can be a turnoff to some people. There's like, oh man, I'm used to having hundreds of spells. Mm. There's like 30. And it's like, well, these 30 do the same work as like 300. So yeah, it's just a different way of doing it. Yeah, it might be confronting to some people, but I kind of, I, I really like the idea of a, like a more soft magic kind of system. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I find it liberating. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. You can role play more. You can do more kind of interesting, exciting things, I find. Oh, yeah. Well, and true excitement comes from the superpowers. Oh, okay. Yeah, we're, they're, they're built with points like anything else. But the there's a, a, a setting rule when you're playing with superheroes. It's called power stunts. And this is the most comic book thing to ever comic book, which is you spend your Benny... And then you get to simulate having a completely different power as long as it makes sense, right? So, like, I'm playing the Flash, and I've got super speed. I really need, like, a tornado whirlwind power right now. It's like, well, I didn't buy that, but I spin my bunny, Benny, I power stunt, and I'm using whirlwind, and the, the, the trapping is I'm just yeah. running around <laughs> in circles really fast, and it makes the tornado, like you do in a comic book. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And... It just works, right? <laughs> like, it's so fantastic. You know? I really like how versatile the system is. I really, I think it's, yeah, you can really sort of create any kind of character to play any sort of game as long as it's in that heroic. Yeah, I mean, that's it. Like, style. Yeah. yeah. And again, setting rules can help you do different things. But we also, like, at Pinnacle in general, we believe, like, not every game needs to be Savage Worlds, right? Like, you don't have to do everything with it. But 
it's very useful when you do want that more adventurous, like more pulpy style, and it's very easy to convert things, right? Especially when you're playing on the fly and you're like, look, here's a horde of bad guys. I don't have to track anything. I don't have to track wounds for them. The figures up, down, or off the table. I just say they're D6 dudes, right? Like, so when they're yeah. rolling, I'm just rolling a bunch of D6s. That's it. Like, that's li- like practically the only numbers that I need, you know? Like, and I might give them an edge or two just to make them a little distinct from one another. Yeah, yeah. And then move on. Yeah, no, super, uh-huh. si- super simple. I really enjoy that. So what do you, what do you need to, to get started playing? Obviously, you need friends and dice, but it's all just in one book, right? Yeah, Swade's going to give you pretty much everything you need for rules-wise. It's, got, it, it's all rules, right? Like, once you've got it, you can build any setting that you want, and we actually have some advice for that at the back of the Swade book. But if you don't want to do that yourself, if you're lazy like a lot of us or don't have the time, Mm. that's where our settings come in. And they will give you characters that you can play, archetypes we call them, where it's like, look, my friends don't have time to build stuff. I'm just going to put these archetypes out. This tells you what the setting is about, and we can just go. Throw it on the table and go. Or you can build your own if you've got the time and the will, right? Um, And then they'll tell you that the setup... Each of them will have a plot point campaign in Savage Tales. Each Savage Tale is usually a one game session event, maybe multiples. To kind of depends on how you run. And same, each chapter of the plot point is usually like one game session. And um, that's the means of, of getting there. And we'll have, mm. so like Deadlands, you'll have a Deadlands book with its extra rules, but then you'll have something like uh, Horror on Headstone Hill, which okay, here's the situation. You're in Headstone Hill. Here's the bad guys. You know, it moves you from different, the mystery unfolds and you go from step to step and here's these monsters and it just walks you through it every time. I find them very easy to run. You know, yeah, we got, so Deadlands is one. There's a bunch of different adventures for it. Deadlands Lost Colony is the same setting, but like hundreds of years later in space. Oh, wow. It's a very... Yeah, very pitch black and aliens, like that kind of tech level. But it's still got like the dark magic and monsters like creeping in the corners of space, like out there. Uh, Legend of Ghost Mountains got everything you need to play. Like if you want to get started, it's like, okay, here's the setting. Here's the characters. Here's maps. Chapter one, go. Bam. You know, and it just takes you through it. We've got a lot. Uh, East Texas University is another setting where your college kids in Texas but they're, the supernatural is real there, and you've got to balance keeping your grades up with not getting killed by slashers or demons, <laughs> you know, and kind of solve the mysteries that are plaguing the town of Pine Box. And the, the latest one that came out is Pine Box Middle School, which is set in the same Texas city, but now you're playing like 12 year olds having to take on these same kinds of monsters with a lot less <laughs> a lot less power and your your big struggle there is how do you get out of the house at night without getting caught <laughs> yeah awesome and i've noticed some there's some other the cool ones as well where i had a look at the the the, yeah. pin, the pinnacle well, website also- like Flash Gordon, I love that. Like, it ah, seems Flash the perfect like system it. to run Flash Gordon. Yeah, it is right. Like, you can't get more pulpy. Well, and the other one that makes a good bridge if people are used to fantasy is we've got Pathfinder for Savage Worlds. So we're we're friends with the folks of Paizo, right? And we licensed their setting, Galarion, and their entire adventure paths. And you just have the stats for them in Savage Worlds, and you can get them and play them like that. And our guy, Mike Barbeau, is the one who adapts all that, and they're brilliant, right? Like, it's really fun playing through those. And it's also very easy to see how you would use the same kinds of things for Dungeons & Dragons adventures, because Mm. it's all the same tropes. It's all the same kind of monsters, essentially, you know, by design. Um, and I, that's very familiar to people, like on, on yeah. a lot of levels. So that's a good place to start to you just pick an adventure path and go. We've also got rifts for Savage Worlds, oh, which is yeah. another, you know, like Augustine setting, like that's been around for a while and has a lot going on. And 
you know, years ago reached out and Sean Patrick Fannin reached out to Kevin Sabeda. And they said, yeah, sure, we could do this. <laughs> we, 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 we shook hands on it. And now we've got like all of these books that convert like the Rifts adventures and, you know, items to use in a Savage Worlds game set in the Rifts setting. Yeah, so, awesome. A lot of options. Yeah, Rifts is one of those ones that I've always wanted to play. It's always like spoken to me and I've never had a chance to do it. It's like seems completely, it's like post-apocalyptic kind of cyberpunk, but oh, yeah. horror and fantasy and yeah, all, all put into yes. weird. All the things that we love at Savage Worlds, <laughs> right? <laughs> no, it looks great. why it was such a good fit. Yeah. <laughs> Um, and, and for, for new GMs and players, like outside of all the settings and the adventures and stuff, are there, are there many resources out there to help a new GM and help a new player, like get, get their head around there Savage Worlds a little better? Are, like, we, yeah. So there's a, our website's pegging.com and we're trying to get better at this. There's a like get started area and we're, we're, we're boosting that up. We're getting more and more videos on it. Like, all right. Here's how to simplify this. Here's, you know, resources. There's free downloads. The other thing on that site is that we've got a ton of free one sheets, they're called. And it's just mm -hmm. one printed page front and back that's got an adventure that you can play in an evening. So even if you don't have any settings, if you've got the rule book, print out a one sheet, off you go. I love that. Like the, the free one sheet, little one shots. That's, that's fantastic. I think I'm going to yeah. run one of those for... Uh... For Deadlands, when we do the some of the actual nice. play, I've been having a look at some of them. There, very creepy, and very cool. <laughs> oh, Deadlands is such a great <laughs> setting, right? It's, oh, it looks like so much fun. It's got the adventure Western stuff, but it's also very much a horror setting. Oh yeah, so it's like, yeah. Well, you can fight back, but be advised. Absolutely. <laughs> I guess, is there anything we missed or are there any sort of final thoughts or anything you wanted to, to add? Yeah, just, and I think I said this before, but like, this is something we're trying to iterate to people is that the system has layers, right? And that top layer is very, very fast and easy. And don't get overwhelmed looking at all of the layers at once. Don't try to do it all at the beginning just have fun with it. Like our tagline for everything that we do is fast, furious, fun. It's gotta be fast, it's gotta be furious, and it's gotta be fun. And if it's not, like we made an error, right? And um, keep it the same at your table. And there's a, you know, a lot of wiggle room there in terms of, is this one roll? Is this a quick encounter? Is this a dramatic task? <laughs> the same event can be all three depending on what feels right at the table at that time and learning that comes yeah um well daryl thank you so much thanks thanks so much for for chatting and for for joining me on the podcast thanks for having me yeah no no thank thank you so much i really appreciate it and where, where can people find more of you and uh more of your stuff if they want yeah, to. so most of my stuff's on peginc.com. <laughs> like I have worked on other game systems and all that, but Pinnacle is pretty much my home now. Cool. And of course, check out the the Legend of Ghost Mountain. Legend of Ghost Mountain on Kickstarter, probably for another couple of hours at this point. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but, yeah, it's wrapping up. So it, if you're it, listening, yeah, when this comes out, please jump on there. It, it doesn't, but even if you miss it, if it sounds like something exciting to you, the, the after Kickstarter ends, there's always a pledge manager, period. Our pledge manager is run through that peginc.com site. So you will see where you, you can essentially get the same thing that was on the Kickstarter there at the same prices as the Kickstarter. Oh, cool. All right. Um, well, yeah, thanks again, Daryl Hayhurst. And uh, yeah, thanks everyone for listening to RPG Quest. Uh, my name is Chris. And we're going to be back next time with some character creation and we're going to dive headfirst into some Savage World adventures with uh, Deadlands. So it's going to be very exciting. And yeah, please, in the meantime, if you want to purchase Savage Worlds or any other books from peginc.com, we have a coupon code uh, for $5 off. That's RPG Quest. And if you use it, you can get $5 off any purchase. Uh, and if you're enjoying the podcast don't forget to subscribe all that sort of stuff uh, it helps other people find the podcast and of course there will be a link to the legend of ghost mountain which you can check out thanks again thank you and uh yeah bye now bye